Hello, this is Peter Vogel at Gardeer, and I've got with me today for our webinar uh, Edward Block, goes by Eddie, and Eric Levy, who's uh, also on. And today, this webinar is going to be about the legal risks of hospitality industry cyber threats. So maybe we'll take one second and kind of introduce ourselves. Eddie, you want to give a, a elevator speech introduction there for a minute? Sure. Um, again, Eddie Block. Um, I've been in the IT security world for the past 20 years. At some point in that 20 years, dropped out and went to law school. Uh, my most recent job before joining Gardeer was serving as the Chief Information Security Officer for the state of Texas. Okay, thanks. Eric, would you briefly tell the audience about your background? Um, senior attorney here at Gardeer. Uh, focus a lot of my work on privacy compliance issues, so dealing with uh, federal and state laws, HIPAA, uh, federal uh, financial compliance laws, education, uh, helping clients to make sure they comply with the laws relating to privacy and security. Okay, thanks. And I'm Peter Vogel. And before I studied law, I had a career as a computer programmer, have a master's in computer science. And at Gardeer, I'm in the trial section um, where I am co-chair of our cybersecurity and privacy group. Uh, so I might add that uh, Eddie and Eric and I work with cyber intrusions and helping our clients deal with that. So this particular discussion is one that I think when just checking out 2017 here, it's the end of uh, September, uh, they had quite a number of intrusions. But if just looking at this list to see what is how that's affected the hospitality uh, community, I think it's very telling. Um, and obviously from a historical perspective, uh, this is something that is just front page news everywhere with Equifax and, uh, you know, I think we just keep peeling things away. As a matter of fact, I did a blog uh, today on the fact that there have been a, a, over 1.9 billion uh, individuals whose identity have been breached in the first half of 2017 worldwide. So this is just a huge issue, I think, to deal with. And one of the issues that came up a few years ago that Kapersky's lab identified was something called Dark Hotel, where uh, residents at hotels would be selectively attacked using the Wi-Fi. And then we've also seen this incident where uh, the, the use of Wi-Fi uh, in what's referred to as the fancy bear has been led a lot of uh, hotel uh, guests to be targets. So, Eddie, I know that uh, from the standpoint of looking at Wi-Fi, what kind of comments that maybe you have to add to that about bad ideas of using hotel Wi-Fi or what are the risks associated with it? Sure. So, I think part of it is, to, part of the takeaway is that, uh, you know, se several years ago, we had general purpose attack tools that, you know, kind of worked against all types of industry. And now we're seeing over the last couple of years a much more targeted attack against specific types of inter industries, including the hotel and, and uh, industry itself. Wi-Fi in uh, hotels is a great um, <clears throat> option for travelers. It's, it's, I, I make use of it a lot. The problem, though, is that most of it tends to be um, a shared Wi-Fi, and a lot of it is unencrypted. So once you're on that network, it's fairly simple to listen to other people's connections. Um, the use of VPNs for business travelers is um, fairly common. So I think that those folks tend to be a little bit more protected. The general public, though, still relies on the uh, the hotel or restaurant to actually provide security. and in a lot of cases, they're not providing adequate security. So, so they're maybe relying on the long, the wrong uh, source there. Because I, I know, you know, one option is always to use your hotspot on your device uh, to try and protect that. So, maybe you know, it's just a few weeks after Equifax, but I think we're going to see the impact in general on consumers is is very widespread about the problems associated with this and, and what's going to happen. But I think probably the critical thing to look at, and this is not new, obviously, for the hospitality community, and that is uh, 
what we're seeing is the crime wave attacking uh, the hotels. So maybe you could talk, Eric, about the Wyndham settlement and how maybe that kind of impacted things going back to 2015. Yeah, well, and and, and apologies to any Wyndham listeners who might be uh, uh, on the webinar, but Wyndham has basically become the poster child for what not to do uh, to protect uh, your guests' uh, confidential uh, protected information. Uh, Wyndham suffered in 2008, 2009, not just one, but three uh, data breaches, which uh, compromised, I want to say, over half a million uh, individual credit card bits of information. Uh, the FTC uh, pursued them vigorously, uh, and it ultimately resulted in a Third Circuit decision saying that the, the they were uh, guilty or liable of um, committing uh, unfair and deceptive uh, practices under the FTC Act. Uh, they then proceeded to enter into a uh, settlement, a, a consent decree, if you will, with the FTC that's going to require 20 years of uh, an information security uh, program that's designed to elevate the protections, 20 years of monitoring and reporting to the FTC. Uh, I can't remember what the financial payouts are in, in terms of the fines and stuff like that, uh, but they have there because hotels offer such ripe pickings, if you will, for uh, especially credit card information. Uh, I think Wyndham sends a message to all hotels and all hotel chains that you better start getting your act together or we'll go after you too. But of course, that's kind of the Federal Trade Commission's mantra is they pick some company as a target to make an example of it. And I agree with you. Unfortunately, Wyndham was you know, the victim of that being the target, but they're not the only ones with the problem. And I think that's part of the issue. Part of what we need to be concerned about, and this is uh, something that uh, we provided in the client alert about the fact that in today's world, it's when, not if. I mean, we know that this is going to happen. So when we look at the kinds of things, though, topic-wise, what we're going to talk about today from an IT perspective and data management, I think that there are certain kinds of, uh, if, you, if, the, if you and the audience are not an IT person, to just talk through some of these issues about the kinds of things that we have to deal with in terms of managing data, uh, there's guest experience management issues. Uh, there's also property management systems. And the kind of data associated with this includes credit card information, obviously. Um, and when there's a disaster or something terrible happens and there's a cyber intrusion, um, it, these kinds of pieces of data are all available. And the kind of information is, is pretty important. Now, then there's also, um, just by way of example, the the, the Saber design here about how you connect all the pieces of data with the customer relationship management and all the different pieces, there's an awful lot of data out there. And, and it makes the customer at the hotel uh, a, a right target, obviously, uh, that we are all concerned about. And including, uh, the, as I mentioned, the customer relationship solution, there are critical kinds of data that are at play. So maybe let, I think we ought to just kind of move into cyber intrusions and the FBI. One of the issues that I've learned from the FBI over time is, and the reason we refer to intrusions is because they, the FBI claims from the time of intrusion till detection is eight months. So what's going on during that eight month period? And that's an average, there are some longer, uh, not so many or less than that. Um, so maybe, Eddie, you could kind of address this life cycle of a breach. Yeah, and I think the eight months is also supported by the Verizon data breach studies, um, where they indicate that it usually takes a matter of minutes for exfiltration of, of corporate data to, to begin um, from the time of the breach itself. Um, the discovery of that breach is again a much later problem and and unfortunately most of the time you discover the breach when somebody knocks on your door whether that's the credit card companies who have zeroed back to um, a fault in your system the fbi but somebody comes knocking on the door um, so at that point then it's it's important to start assembling that internal response team and most of the time, this isn't an, an IT team. This is really a business team because it affects the business systems. That 
team needs to consist of have some folks from IT, but it also needs to involve um, someone in executive staff that can make quick and effective decisions based on recommendations from the rest of the team. It needs to be somebody from legal to look at reporting requirements, to look at the types of regulations that may be impacted. And also you need to have the PR folks involved because they are gonna help message it out to the affected people. Well, I think the critical part too is to be ready for this and make sure that you have an incident response plan You or, and all companies, regardless of industries. And I think that as we point out for this audience and hospitality, we're particularly vulnerable because of the kind of data that is actually there. But when we look at evaluating how, where, what's a good resource, my friends at the FBI kind of always tell me the time to meet the FBI agents is not after an intrusion. You should get to know them now. So this is, they have some great resources and we certainly encourage you to take a look at that. One of the other resources that I think is very helpful, although it may seem kind of silly, cybersecurity for dummies, this is really a very handy kind of book and easily found on the internet. So we would encourage you to do that. One of the things we're looking at today is ransomware. And uh, Eric, that may be something that you could address about the issues associated with that. Well, I mean, and, and obviously everybody knows what we're talking about. You get a you get a uh, an email that seems to be from a trusted source that asks you to click on a link. The minute you click on the link, malware is installed on the computer. It uh, filters through the system and basically shuts it down, uh, or at least freezes it until you can uh, pay the ransom. You pay the ransom, they say they will uh, they will release the system. Um, unencrypt the data. Unencrypt the data, exactly. Unencrypt the data. Um, now, most, um, if you ask the FBI, because I've asked the FBI uh, whether you should pay the ransom or not, the answer is usually no. Well, the Department of Homeland Security says don't do it. Yeah. Um, now it's hard. It's hard because I mean everybody. I guess when you hear ransomware, you think the ransom is going to be like fifty thousand dollars. The average ransom is about five hundred dollars, and so it's very tempting for companies to say, "Well, that's yep. you know that's an easy amount to pay to get the data back." Unfortunately, a you don't know whether you'll get the data back, and even if you do, you become a a, a ripe target for them to keep going after you. So the better solution, um, one that several companies we know have implemented is to back up your data sort of every day. And so even if you do, well, you shouldn't be clicking on these links to begin with. Right. But even if you do, you only lose a day's worth of information as well, opposed to a lot. Yeah, but a lot of the ransomware now stays right. dormant for 30 days. So it kind of destroys that. And so then part of it is when we're looking at the the the, the reality of personal identifiable information and credit card information is what do we, how do we go about reporting that? We now have 48 states that have reporting requirements and 89 countries. But Eddie, I know in our experience in doing these reports and Eric as well, uh, there's a lack of uniformity between states and countries about uh, this. And some are in direct conflict with, with, you have to do, report one within 72 hours in one state and another, it's as soon as you reasonably know something. Right, and the level of detail varies as well. I know one state, Massachusetts, specifically tells you not to provide the customer, the individuals, with a detailed description of the incident, whereas the other ones, uh, a lot of other states, require you to provide a detailed description of the end or as detailed as you can. So yeah, you you you, you have to end up sending different letters with different bits of information, depending on what state the, the victims are in. And Eddie, I know you've recently helped some clients uh, prepare some of these letters, and there are companies that are in the business of preparing these different versions. And what's your experience been with that? So I think there's there's a couple different ways of reporting. I, I've seen recently um, a couple incidents where we had a handful of people that we needed to report the information to. And in those cases, Working with in-house counsel, we've been able to draft that letter and, and get it delivered. In breaches where we've seen you know hundreds of people involved, it really is best to go out to an outside firm that um, can help you with that notification process. Um, you know we're still working with in-house counsel to to draft the the response, but then contracting with somebody to actually do the 
the mailings to stand up a uh, hotline for folks that need to call in with more information to manage the credit uh, credit reporting and credit notification credit monitoring systems um, it, it takes a lot of that off of the, the firm that has had the incident and may actually still be working through the incident. And, and of course, some of this may be covered by your cyber insurance policy, so that's something to look at as well. One of the other more complicating issues, we were just talking about personal identifiable information, and that is PCI data, uh, the payment card industry, the five largest credit card companies. Um, actually, these are not laws. These are the rules of the road if you want to use credit card companies. I'm sure everyone listening in today is familiar with PCI and the requirements. And number six on the uh, data security standards is, I think, what we all look to. But I've seen studies that have come out that indicate that about 65% of the companies, after they get certified, within a few months, they're no longer qualified. So this is a, kind of a moving target. So one of the things that credit card companies have done is they've added, and I think everybody uh, participating today is aware of adding the chips, but the reason they added the chips was not necessarily to help us, but it was to shift the liability from the credit card companies to the point of sale devices. So they, credit card companies would have less exposure. So I'm not quite sure in terms of PCI that that necessarily solves all our problems, but then I think one of the big issues that everybody needs to be concerned about is uh, the new May 2018 GDPR because of the impact on EU residents worldwide. So, Eric, maybe you could address some of the issues with that. Sure. I mean, if you uh, basically, if you do business with EU residents, EU individual residents, uh, you are required to comply with the general data protection regulation that, as Peter said, comes into effect in May of next year. Um, and they, uh, you know, the GDPR was an attempt to standardize regulations across Europe because before, much like the breach reporting in the United States, they had a patchwork of different rules and regulations. Uh, but these are a lot more stringent uh, in terms of, A, what you can do with the data, but B, in terms of how you protect the data, what you need to do to report the data, um, requirements that everybody with a, that processes a certain amount of information retains a, a data protection officer. A, a employee specifically hired to deal with GDPR compliance, and perhaps the biggest thing is the fines, uh, which can be, uh, for the most egregious cases, I'm not saying this is what's generally going to happen, 4% of gross turnover. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I think, or 20 billion euros, or 20 million euros, excuse me, whichever whichever is larger. So, uh, you've got a, 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 a an organization that's very serious about protecting what it considers to be, you know, fundamental human rights. And, uh, and and so, Eddie, how do you see this as impacting the hospitality community? Because obviously, nobody necessarily knows who's an EU resident that may be staying in their property. Yeah, and and that's uh, applicability is is what I've seen as the most common question around this. So the GDPR says that if you are offering goods or services to EU residents, then you're required to comply with GDPR. And clearly, most of the folks in the hospitality industry are going to be doing that, especially hotels uh, and large food uh, and hospitality companies. So at this point, you're going to have to be working on GDPR compliance It's and, and building systems that can either segregate or identify EU residents is not an easy, uh, it's not an easy process in a lot of cases. And, and a lot of businesses are, are going to run out of time trying to implement those those systems. Um, I was at an event where I was speaking to a handful of uh, folks at, at one particular company, and someone in the front row said, "You know, you can skip all this GDPR stuff because we don't we don't have any EU information." And somebody in the back of the room said, "Oh yeah, we do." Um, so even within the same company, they had no um, no understanding of. of all of their business practices and who all was going to be affected. Right. No, yeah. I, I think that's very important. It's sad to say, uh, even though the law came out over a year ago and people could start preparing as soon as the law went, you know, became published and was available to see, there are, I, I saw a story that said that like less than 18% of companies who should be GDPR compliance have made any effort 
to comply with it. And it's not something you can do in a month. It's no, it takes a lot of time. It's a huge effort. So I guess kind of in conclusion, in terms of the topic of what we've been talking about today, having some kind of data breach response plan, some organized uh, methodology to deal with an incident that occurs is pretty critical. And so I think our advice to the audience is if you don't have a response plan, it's something you really need to do and you need to review it. And I think you also need to test it. So thank you very much for joining us today. Please feel free to reach out to Eddie, Eric, or me with any kind of questions you might have. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.